Hi, today we're starting the chapter on statistical hypothesis testing. So today, in this first section, I'm going to try to give you the big picture, try to give you the idea of what hypothesis testing is, what it's all about, what's involved, what are the basic concepts and terminology that you need to know about. And then next time, in the next section, we will start working through the details of actually doing some hypothesis testing problems. But first, right now, we're just looking at the big picture. I'm trying to introduce you to the basic idea. What is hypothesis testing? And give you some examples to think about. So, I, whoops. I remember when I was a kid, the Chips Ahoy brand chocolate chip cookies used to advertise that they had an average of 16 chocolate chips in their cookies. That was their slogan, 16 chips in Chips Ahoy. So suppose there is a, a cookie that advertises 16 chips per cookie, and you get one of their cookies, and you actually count how many chocolate chips there are in that cookie, and turns out that in the cookie you have, there are 15 chocolate chips. So should you be mad? Should you complain and say, hey, you are lying about that 16 chips? Well, no, that's just an average. Some cookies might have more than average, some might have less than average, but just because the average is 16 chips per cookie doesn't mean that you're going to get 16 chips in any particular cookie. In fact, they even ran an ad about that. 16 chips? Yes, more likely than not. Of course, Nabisco cannot guarantee that every Chips Ahoy cookie will have 16 of these rich, pure, luscious chocolate chips inside. But the 16 chip chocolate count averages out pretty nicely. Don't worry if you get fewer one time, the next Chips Ahoy may make it up to you. 16 chips, that's a lot, and sometimes it may be more. Okay, so that's just an average. Now what if you get three cookies, and you count how many chocolate chips there are in each one of those three cookies, and one of them has 15, one of them has 14, one of them has 15, so the average number of chocolate chips just for those three cookies, if you add those three numbers together and divide by three, it comes out as about 14.67. So notice I use the symbol for a sample mean, X bar. So if they claim the average is 16, but you got a sample mean, an average for just those three cookies of 14.67, which is not 16, can you complain? Should you start writing nasty letters to the company? Well, probably not. That's only three cookies. You could certainly get three that all had less than average. Now what if you get a hundred cookies? You really want to find out, so you, you go out, you buy enough bags of those cookies that you can look at a hundred cookies. And in each one of those 100 cookies, you count how many chocolate chips there are. And let's say you do that, and you come up with a mean of 15.2 chips for that sample of 100 cookies. So now you're looking at a pretty big sample, 100 cookies, and they have an average of only 15.2 chocolate chips per cookie. So that means one of two things. It might mean that the population mean the average for all of their cookies isn't really 16, that they were lying, or at least incorrect, when they said the average was 16. So that's one thing it could mean. But the other possibility is that mu really is 16, but your sample was different from the whole population due to sampling error, which just means that because of individual variation from cookie to cookie, the 
what you saw in your sample was just a, a little different from what you would see if you could look at the whole population, if you could actually count the number of chocolate chips in every single one of the cookies they make. So, how do you decide between those possibilities? Well, one approach you could take is you could think, well, suppose mu really was 16. Suppose the population mean really was 16 chips per cookie. Then working with that assumption, you could use the techniques we used in section 6.3 to find the probability that you would get a sample mean that was less than or equal to 15.2, which is what you actually did find. Now, suppose you do that, and that probability comes out to be 12%. That would mean that if the company was right about the average number of chocolate chips per cookie being 16, you've still got a 12% chance of getting a sample where the average number of chocolate chips per cookie in that sample was the kind of thing you, you found, lower than 15.2. So if something has a 12% chance of being true, you can't rule it out. It happens sometimes. So I can still believe, it's still possible that the population mean really is 16. Now, what if we did that calculation? We found the probability that X bar, the sample mean, is less than or equal to 15.2, and that came out to be 0.1%. So something that has a 0.1% chance of happening. Well, it could happen. It's not impossible, but it's really unlikely. So then you got to start thinking, well, maybe it's more likely that the population mean really isn't 16, that that's incorrect. Okay, for now, we're, we're this isn't the exact approach we're going to be using. For now, I'm just getting you used to the concepts. So let's go ahead and talk about another example. Let's suppose you're doing medical research and you're testing an experimental new drug that's supposed to do something that you can actually measure. It's supposed to have some measurable effect on some variable, like maybe it's supposed to decrease the body temperature of people who have a fever or it's supposed to decrease the amount of time it takes somebody to get over a cold, or it's supposed to reduce blood pressure, or something like that. So how do you test to find out whether it really does what it's supposed to do? I mean, you could give the drug to somebody, wait a few hours, see if their body temperature, their fever has gone down. But if it has, how do you know whether it was because of the drug or whether it would have just gone down on its own. You could give the drug to a group of people and see if there's a change. But again, that change could be just due to chance factors, random variation, it, could, it would have happened anyway. How do you know if it was because of the drug? Well, might be, might not be. And in this case, the null hypothesis, what we call the null hypothesis, is that the drug didn't make a difference. Any difference we actually saw in our test is just due to random chance or other factors. So the no hypothesis is that there's no difference. And so we don't have to keep writing out the words no hypothesis. The symbol that abbreviates those words no hypothesis is a capital letter H with a subscript zero. So that's the symbol for the no hypothesis. And then the alternative hypothesis is that there is a difference, that people who take this drug do have a lower body temperature overall than people who don't, or whatever it's supposed to do. And the symbol for the alternative hypothesis is H sub 1, a capital letter H with a subscript 1. And I have seen other books that use H sub A, but our book uses H sub 1, so that's what I'll use. Another example situation, suppose you get 25 boys and 25 girls, you have them play a video game, and then you look at the average score that the boys got, they got an average of, turns out, 3,850 points, 
And those girls turned out to get an average score of 3,710 points. So it was different for the boys and for the girls. The boys had a higher average score than the girls did. And does this mean that boys are better than girls at this game? Well, maybe, maybe not. These particular boys scored higher than these particular girls on this particular time playing the game. But does that mean that boys are better than girls in general? So in this example, the null hypothesis would be that there is no difference in general. That for all girls and all boys, the averages would be the same. If you could somehow find the average score for all the boys in the world and all the girls, those averages wouldn't be any different from each other. And the alternative hypothesis would be that there is a difference, that the average for all girls really would be different than the average for all boys. Okay, another situation, another example. Let's say that a particular kind of car is known to get, on the average, 24.6 miles per gallon of gasoline. And you've developed a new fuel additive that you claim will increase mileage. So if the car uses this new additive, it's going to get better than 24.6 miles per gallon. So in this situation, the null hypothesis would be that there's no difference. The additive doesn't make any difference. So the average mileage for cars using the additive is still going to be 24.6 miles per gallon. The alternative hypothesis would be that it does make a difference, that the average mileage for cars using this additive is more than 24.6 miles per gallon. And here, in this particular example, we're only interested in a, in a difference in one direction. We only care whether or not it raises the mileage. Sometimes we only care about one kind of difference. Does the additive raise the mileage or not? Does the drug lower a fever, body temperature or not? And sometimes we care about if there's a difference in either direction. Are boys and girls different either by boys scoring higher than girls or by boys scoring lower, lower than girls? So a one-tailed test is when we're only interested in a change or difference in one direction. A two-tailed test would be when we're interested in a change in two directions. So let's say we do test a sample of cars with the additive. We've put it in a bunch of cars of this kind, uh, test to see how many miles per gallon they get, and we come up with, they get an average mileage of 25.1 miles per gallon. And that is indeed greater than the old average of 24.6. So the question is, is it enough higher? We might say, yes, this additive does increase mileage. The average mileage of the cars with this additive was higher than it was before. If we say that, we would be rejecting the null hypothesis. Remember, that's that no, there's no difference. And favoring the alternative hypothesis, that it does make a difference. But if that was our conclusion, we might be wrong about that. It might be that the actual population average miles per gallon might still be 24.6, and the difference we saw was due to chance factors or sampling error, things other than any difference that the additive made. So that would be a type one error, rejecting the null hypothesis when it's really true. On the other hand, if we don't reject the null hypothesis, we're saying, oh, this doesn't necessarily increase mileage. The difference we saw was small enough that it could be just due to chance, in that case, we might be right or we might be wrong, and if we're wrong, that would be a type two error, not rejecting the null hypothesis when it's false. So I'm gonna stop this video here and then come back in part two and go into more detail about type one and type two errors. See you then.